see a picture up on the board right now. What does it remind you of? Nobody? Yeah? Okay, okay. A little bit of a gravitational unit. Um, we have uh, planets orbiting around the sun, or you could say moons orbiting around a planet. Sure, that could look like that. Sure. It's funny you say that, actually. It's not what I was thinking, but that's a good observation. Because in the end, one of the models of the atom that we're going to talk about later on in the last unit of Physics 30 is called the planetary model. And the reason we call it the planetary model is because it's much like what we envision the solar system to be, planets orbiting around the sun. This is an atom. This is pretty much our current model of the atom. It's not perfect, but um, what I want to illustrate today um, can be illustrated by this diagram here. What's in the middle of this atom? Okay, if we're talking about planets and the sun, what would be in the place of the sun? What do you call that with all? Thing in the middle. Yeah, it's the nucleus. And what's inside the nucleus? Yep. Protons and neutrons. Good. What's the charge of a proton? Yep. Yeah, it's positive one. In chemistry, you learn it's positive one, right? A neutron is neutral, right? Not negative. Careful with that. It's not ne negative. It's neutral. So you got a nucleus that is positively charged due to the protons that are in the nucleus. What is this thing that's circling around the nucleus, orbiting around the nucleus there? Yeah, Bryce? Good. It's electrons that are orbiting around the nucleus. And what's the charge of the electron? I don't have to have an exact value right now if you just know positive, negative, neutral. If the proton is positive and the neutron is neutral, then the electron is negatively charged. Good. This is what we're going to focus on in this unit. We do talk in our last unit of Physics 30 about the nucleus, the protons and neutrons, and how they interact, and how they can do some pretty neat things. Okay, but this unit is focusing on these electrons, these negative electrons that are orbiting around the nucleus. The reason being is that electricity is an, e is an electron phenomenon. When things happen in electricity, things happen because of the electrons. If things are happening because of the protons, then it's not electricity. It's nuclear physics. You've got a nuclear reaction taking place if protons are, are moving around. If things are going to move, okay, if things are going to build up, if things are going to uh, decrease, go somewhere else, it's going to be the electrons that do it. And the reason is because those electrons are not tightly bound to the nucleus like the protons are tightly bound inside the nucleus. We get two types of charge, and they both come back to, they both stem from that model of the atom that I just drew you a minute ago. Positive charge, you could say, has something to do with protons. Yes, it does. But what does it have to do with protons? If I get a balloon that I rub against my hair, and I make that balloon positively charged, it doesn't mean the balloon is all protons, right? What does it mean? If that balloon is positively charged, what does it mean? Good. It has more protons, not necessarily one more. It has more protons than electrons. In fact, the charge of a proton in an electron is so small that in all likelihood, um, you wouldn't even be able to measure the difference between a balloon that had a charge of plus one and a balloon that was neutral. You'd have to have way more protons than uh, electrons in order to make it a measurable positive charge. Negative charge, similarly, is going to be a charge that doesn't have just electrons. Of course, you can't have just electrons. Right? The atom is made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. If you have just electrons, you don't have matter, really. But rather, you have more electrons than protons. Now, I haven't put the third category up there. What would the third category be? Neutral. And what would that be? If I was to write something down for neutral, what would I say about protons and neutrons? Good. It's the same, same number of protons and neutrons. Good. The unit that we use to measure charge, and this is a brand new one for you, it's called a Coulomb. It's named after a guy named Charles Augustine de Coulomb, who did a lot of work with electricity. So he gets a new unit named after him. Now, this is a, a foreign unit to us. Okay, a a non-familiar unit to us. 
Okay, when we started Physics 20, we were familiar with what a meter was. We were familiar with what a second was. We were familiar with what a kilometer per hour was, right? Because it was within our realm of experience prior to starting Physics 20. But now that we're going into electricity and Physics 30, here's a unit that we're not really familiar with. Even if we've heard it before, we don't have a concept as to its size. Well, we know that a meter is about this big. We know that 100 kilometers per hour is about the speed that you're traveling on the highway. We have a grasp as to the magnitude of that. A coulomb, let me give you some perspective on the size of that one. It would take about this many electrons about that many electrons to make one coulomb of charge, or that many protons to make one coulomb of charge. About. That's not exact, but about. That's 10 to the 19. That means a coulomb is a really, really big unit, a really big unit, if it takes 10 to the 19 electrons or protons to make up a coulomb of charge. It's so big that we often don't even see that unit used. We often see microcoulombs which is 10 to the minus 6 coulombs. Or we see millicoulombs, which is 10 to the minus 3 coulombs. Or we might see nanocoulombs, which is 10 to the minus 9 coulombs. We don't very often actually have a full coulomb because it takes so many electrons and protons to make that up. Nevertheless, that is our base unit of charge. And whenever we're doing a calculation with coulombs, with electric charge, we've got to use that unit of coulombs. And even if it's given to us in microcoulombs, we've got to convert that. If it takes 10 to the 19 electrons to make up a coulomb of charge, okay, the coulomb is a big unit of charge. It must mean an electron has a small charge if we express it in coulombs. In fact, it does. The charge of an electron is negative 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. The charge of a proton, plus 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Do we need to memorize those numbers? Of course not. You probably will remember those numbers after you use them enough times, but you don't need to try to memorize them. Why don't you take a look at your data sheet for a second. Everybody flip open your data book, go to the second page where you're going to see this. On the right-hand side of that data book, or that uh, data sheet, you're going to see all kinds of different particles, including an alpha particle, which we had in one of our collision questions back in Unit 1, including protons and electrons and neutrons. Then we have positrons and electron neutrinos, first-generation fermions, all these things that we've never heard of before. That's OK. Today we're going to focus on, of course, these two things. The mass is given to us there clearly in kilograms. The charge is given to us, but it doesn't say negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, or positive 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. It says negative 1 and positive 1. Bryce, I think you told me before an electron was negative 1, right? That's what you learn in chemistry, right? It's negative, negative 1? Negative 1 what? Negative 1 E. What's an E? An E is the elementary charge, and you'll learn the significance of that uh, later on in Unit 4. For now, you just have to know what it is. An elementary charge over on the left-hand side of your sheet is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. So an electron that is negative 1 E is really negative 1 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, which is? negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. Or a proton, which is plus 1e, is plus 1 times the elementary charge, which gives us plus 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Just out of curiosity, if you were ever given a question where you needed to find the charge of an alpha particle, which, again, we'll learn a lot more detail about the alpha particle in our last unit, but if you needed the charge tomorrow, could you find it? What does it say it is here? Plus 2e. What does that mean? What does that mean in coulombs? Because that's really what I care about, right? The charge in coulombs. Look at what would the charge of the alpha particle be in coulombs? Good. 
two times the elementary charge. In other words, the alpha particle would be 3.2 times 10 to the minus 19 coulomb. Does that make sense? You can find the charge of these other things as well, these electrons, these positrons down here as well. But in the end, these are the two that we've got to worry about right now. Good? A couple more terms. Let me cover these up because I don't want you to see them right now. You can tell me what a conductor is. In the context of electricity, that is not in the context of your science 9 heat unit. In the context of electricity, a conductor is what? You can't give me a definition? Give me an example. Tell me something you know about a conductor. Yeah. Okay, so a metal rod would be a good example of a conductor. Usually it is, yes. Yep. I'm sorry? You could be a conductor, yeah. Yeah, metal would be a better one, but yeah, yeah. When it's got stuff in it, yeah. metal's the best conductor, though. Yeah, yeah. We, we know that, right? And it, it, it's some intuitive level. We know that metals are the best electrical conductors. How come? Who takes chemistry here? Chemistry people might, might know the answer to this. What do what what's different about metals? Than non-metals, what separates metals from non-metals, Michael? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. That separates any atom from any other atom, but specifically the category of metals from non-metals. What's different about their electrons? This is electricity, right? It's got to have something to do with electrons. What's different about a metal's electrons? Uh, nah. Yeah, that's not what we're looking for here. Generally, metals are good conductors. And why are they good conductors? Because metals are materials in which the electrons in the outermost regions aren't as tightly bound. They're free to move. Somebody this morning, when I asked what a conductor was, said um, it's a material that I'm paraphrasing, but basically she said it's a material that allows electrons to move. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a good definition of a conductor, a material that allows the electrons to move. A material in which the ele electrons in the outermost regions of the atom are free to move. So they do. Protons don't move. How come? They're in the nucleus. There's this force in the nucleus called the strong nuclear force, which we'll talk about in our last unit. And that's a really, really strong force. That's why they call it the strong nuclear force. It acts over really, really short distances. So if you got a proton over here and a proton over here or a neutron over here, they're not going to be attracted dramatically to each other. But if they're in such close proximity like they are in the nucleus, there's a really, really strong force of attraction there. It's not an electrical force of attraction. It's a strong nuclear force of attraction. But that force of attraction keeps these things together. They don't want to, they don't, don't want to break apart. The electrons, on the other hand, now on some materials, it's pretty easy to get the electrons to leave, to leave that atom. In conductors, it's easy to get them to leave. An insulator, well, it's the exact opposite, right? The electrons are tightly bound to the nucleus. They're not free to move around. Now understand here that there's not a clear line between a conductor and an insulator. There are varying degrees of conductivity. Even insulators will conduct electricity to some degree. Air is usually a pretty good insulator, right? But when there's a rainstorm, what happens sometimes? Clouds all start rubbing together, water molecules in the clouds, and what happens? We get lightning. Air is not a great conductor, but yet lightning can still conduct through the air to the ground. Now, it tends to happen when it rains, not at other times. How come? We alluded to this before. Yeah? Because water is a pretty good conductor, right? The moisture in the air makes the air a better conductor. We'd still say air is a pretty good insulator, but 
but there's varying degrees of how good of an insulator is. You don't need to copy down this page. Uh, this page just simply shows us those varying degrees of conductivity. You see on the top here, we've got these conductors. Pretty much all what? What do you notice about them? What do most of them have in common? They're metals, right? What do you see down here? Well, these are insulators. Wood, glass, rubber, plastic. The numbers on the left-hand side here are not any special unit of conductivity, rather they're just relative conductivities. What we're saying here is a number that's 10 to the 8, like silver, really, really, really good conductor. Gold's a fantastic conductor. By the way, you ever, you ever buy an electronics cable, like a HDMI cable or something like that, and it's, see that it's gold-plated? What would be the potential benefit of having a gold-plated cable? It, it, it's, it's a better conductor, right? I'm not sure, to be honest, that it really makes a difference in that context, okay? or whether it's just marketing. But gold is a very, very good conductor. So that's at least the reason why they do that. 10 to the 8. Silver is 10 to the 8. 10 to the 8 what? Well, it's just 10 to the 8 relative to other things. Wood, 10 to the minus 9. So basically we're saying silver is 10 to the 17 times better of a conductor than wood. Wood will conduct electricity. But 10 to the 17 times worse than silver will conduct electricity. What... Uh, What's the wire in our houses made out of? I hope it's made out of copper. They always use copper now. For the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years or so, they use copper. They used to use sometimes another good conductor, not quite as good as copper, but aluminum. Anybody know why they don't use aluminum now? Not as good of a conductor as copper? Almost. Shouldn't make any difference as far as how good of a conductor it is. Aluminum is a good conductor. What's the problem with it? It does, yeah. Yeah, it'll melt quicker. It also tends to... Actually, that's a good, uh, good point, but um, I don't know, I, to be honest, I don't know what the cost of aluminum is right now, but I know copper is through the roof. Uh, copper is really, really expensive right now. So copper is so expensive, in fact, right now, that there are people, you know, people used to rob banks. Now people steal copper, and then they take it to a scrapyard, and they sell the copper to a scrapyard. Okay, that's how valuable copper is. There's literally been people, yeah, I've read in the news, more than one person that's been electrocuted to death in manholes. In the middle of the night, they break into a, get down into a manhole and try to cut wire to steal the wire to take to, uh, to, a, to a wrecker... Uh, like a metal shop where they can sell it. And they get electrocuted. They kill themselves trying to steal copper. It's that valuable. I'm not sure about aluminum. Okay? The other thing that I was going to say about aluminum besides its melting is that it tends to arc. Um, what does that mean, arc? <coughs> Electrons will jump from one wire to another wire. That's not always a problem. But if you get two wires in your, in your wall of your house, and the electrons are jumping from one to another. What does that do? You get a fire. Right? Your house burns down. Um, so it's a good conductor, but just because it's a good conductor doesn't mean it's, it's good for all things. Right? So varying degrees, all the way from 10 to the 8, 10 to the minus 15. Um, rubber's, hey, r rubber's a very poor conductor, right? It's a good insulator. It's a very poor conductor. Okay? But I'll tell you what. I got rubber sole shoes on right now. I would not want to stand outside in a lightning storm, let's say with a golf club in my hand, pointing it up to the sky and saying, I challenge you, lightning, because you know what? It would win. Why? Golf club's a good conductor. I'm an okay conductor. My shoes, a very poor conductor, but a good enough conductor to allow lightning to go through them into the ground, right? So even rubber is a conductor, just not a very good one. All right, three laws of electric charge. We're going to talk about these three laws, and then we're going to do one more law, which we kind of separate from these three. And we'll do a few problems, and we'll have a break. First law, 
Opposite charges attract each other. What does that mean? Opposite charges. Does that mean like big charge and little charge? What does that mean? Good. Positive charge and negative charge attract each other. Opposites attract. Attract means that they come together. Right? They're pulled together. Sometimes we say people, like when people are attracted to each other, opposites attract, right? Opposite people that are attracted to each other don't always stay attracted to each other, but nevertheless, the rule kind of works at some level. Opposites attract. Like charges repel each other. What does that mean? Well, positive repels or pushes away positive. Negative pushes away negative. Sometimes you see two people, two buddies. They just, they just never seem to get along. Why? Because they're so much alike. Have you ever heard that? They just can't get along because they're so much alike. They push each other away. Okay? Like charges repel each other. The third law, you've got to be careful with this last word here. Charged objects attract neutral objects. Protons don't attract neutrons. Okay. Positive, neutral. Photons don't attract neutrons. Not electrically. They do by that strong nuclear force, but not electrically. Charges don't attract neutral. Charged objects attract neutral objects. You'll see why a little bit later on, why you need to have a charge in a neutral object as opposed to just a neutral particle like a neutron. And neutrons aren't attracted to anything electrically needs to be a neutral object with both protons and electrons in it. And finally, this last law, which is kind of separate from the other three, the law of conservation of charge, much like the law of conservation of anything else. It says, just like conservation of energy says, energy can't be created or destroyed. Momentum says, PI equals PF, but really that means that momentum can't be created or destroyed. Conservation of charge says that charge can't be created or destroyed. For the most part, if you've got this many protons, you're always going to have that many. If you this many electrons, you're always going to have that many. Charge can be transferred from one object to the other. What kind of charge can be transferred? Let's put a little arrow here and be specific. Charge can be transferred what kind of charge? Not neutrons, because they're irrelevant for us here. So we've got protons and electrons left. Electrons can be transferred from one object to another. But you can't create charge, and you can't destroy charge. It is what it is. This is going to manifest itself in a lot of ways for us this this year, this unit in particular, but this as the year goes on. But one way it's going to manifest itself is a simple situation where you got a few different charges and they make contact with each other. And maybe you got this this balloon that you rubbed against your hair and then you put it against the wall. Or maybe you're walking across the carpet with your leather soled shoes building up a charge, and then you touch somebody in the finger and shock them. And the law of conservation of charge becomes the main principle by which we describe that. So let me give you a problem here. So ball number one has a charge of three coulombs. It touches ball number two with a charge of minus one coulombs. This should say, by the way, the balls are then separated. So they're touching each other, but then they're not touching each other. After they're separated, the first ball then touches the third ball with a charge of minus 5 coulombs. What's the final charge on all three of them? Well, understand this, please. When one charged conductor touches another charged conductor or neutral conductor, 
the goal of physics is to balance those charges out. So let's say we have a neutral object and we have an object that has a charge of minus 4. We touch them together. They want to balance out to be minus 2 and minus 2. Okay, total charge of minus 4 still. That doesn't always happen. If one object is pointy and the other is rounded, the rounded one will end up with more charge than the pointy one. If one object is big and the other object is small, then the bigger one will end up with more charge than the smaller one. But generally, the goal is to balance. So we're going to assume whenever we have a question like this that that goal is fulfilled. The size of the objects, same. The shape of the objects, the same. So they all have the capacity to hold the same charge. How exactly are we going to figure out what the final charge in all three of them is then? Well, I want you to make a little chart. Every time you see a question where you have three objects, you want to find the charge on all three of them, make a chart. There's my three objects. The charge on those objects starts off as plus three. It starts off as minus one, and it starts off as minus five. Before we do anything to it, those are the charges. This is ball one touches ball two. One touches two. Okay, what's the total charge there between one and two? Plus three minus one gives me plus two. If those two charges balance, and we're going to assume they do, equal size, equal shape, if those two charges balance, then what are they going to balance out to be? Remember, the total charge after the balance has to be plus 2 as well. Hand up? No? Kathleen, what do you think they're going to balance it to be? Good. Plus 1 and plus 1. Look, plus 3 and minus 1 gives me plus 2. Plus 1 and plus 1 gives me plus 2. Kathleen, what did you do mathematically there? Good. So you average them, basically, right? Now, the reason we didn't include the third one is because the third one's not touching yet, right? If they all touched at the same time, then we'd, we'd add them up and divide by three. Exactly. doesn't usually happen. Usually when you get these problems, they're, they're stages. One touches another one, and then they're separated, and then one touches another one after that. By the way, what's this one going to be? What's number three going to be here before I do anything else? Nothing's happened to it, right? It hasn't touched anything yet. Minus 5. Now, it is possible for charges to, to arc or jump from one to the other before they physically touch. Okay. We'll assume that they're not doing that. They're touching each other. All right, number 1 touches number 3 now. What's the total charge between the two of those guys? Plus 1, minus 5 gives me minus... Four, what are they going to balance it to be? Zach, what are they going to balance it to be? Good. Minus two and minus two. What happens to the second one? Stays the same. Okay, it's already made its changes. So the final charge on all three of these is minus two coulombs, plus one coulombs, and minus two coulombs. Good. Let's do a final little check here. Just to make sure we haven't made some silly mistake somewhere. Let's find the total charge of all three of these at each of the stages here. Plus three, minus one, minus five gives me minus three. Plus one, plus one, and minus five gives me minus three. Minus two, plus one, minus two gives me minus three. Has the law of conservation of charge been fulfilled? Sure, it has to be. Okay, if you go through that little check and you find the final charge is the same in all of them, you've probably done this right. You probably haven't made a mistake. I'm going to take a look at number 32 right now in your booklet. I'll give you about a minute to do that, and we'll take a look at it as a class. Notice, as you're about to start it, though, notice a couple of things. First of all, we've got a distance in centimeters. We haven't even done anything with distance yet in this unit. We've also got two charges in microcoulombs. 
which is 10 to the minus 6 coulombs. Remember we said a while ago that you're likely to see things like micro or milla because a coulomb is so big? Okay. Here's the first time you see it. It doesn't change the way you do it. You just got to be prepared to remember your final answer is going to be expressed in micro coulombs as well. Okay, let's see what you can do with that. Let's have a look here, guys. If we add these two charges up, and there's only two, so there's no, there's no table that we have to make here. If we add these up, 4.5 microcoulombs plus negative 2.40 microcoulombs gives me a total charge of 2.10 microcoulombs. A total charge of 2.10. Now, Kathleen said we had to take the total charge and divide it by 2, right? We do that here too. When we do that, when we average them, we end up getting 1.05 microcoulombs. So the answer would be A. Notice we didn't have to convert to coulombs there. Could we have? Sure, sure. We didn't need to. If we do any more calculations with it, though, we got to convert to coulombs. Okay, one more. Number 33. Have a peek at that one, please. Nathan got an answer of 2252. Two. Let's see if he's right here, okay? Um, let me give you an analogy here to help you understand how we go about solving this, though, before we actually do it. Um, Nathan, you go into Safeway, and you want to buy oranges. Each orange weighs 200 grams. You just kind of turn around, you're talking to somebody, and you're putting oranges in a bag. You didn't even notice how many you put in the bag. Okay, you take it to the cash register, they weigh it. It's 1.2 kilograms. Okay, so remember those numbers. Your bag of oranges, however many are in there, 1.2 kilograms. Each orange is 200 grams. How many oranges is in the bag? 1.2 kilograms, 200 grams per orange. How many oranges in the bag, Michael? Six. How do you know that? How would you do that? You divide it. You divide it, the total mass by the mass of one orange, right? Make sense? We all could solve that question involving oranges, right? Given enough time, everybody would have said 1.2 kilograms divided by 0.2 kilograms gives me six. Well, let's do the same thing here, almost, when we're finding the number of electrons. Except instead of mass, let's say the charge total divided by the charge of one electron. Instead of total mass, total charge. Mass for one orange, charge for one electron. The total charge is negative 3.60 times 10 to the minus 17 coulombs. The charge of one electron is negative 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Divide the two. What do we end up getting? 2.25 times 10 to the 2, which is 2252, expressed as A decimal BC times 10 to the D. Got it? There's going to be a dozen or two times this year where you have to find a number of something. Okay, number of electrons is a relatively common thing to have to find. But even if you have to find a number of photons, whatever that is, you're always going to use the same basic method. Okay, whenever you want to find a number of anything, it's the total something divided by the amount for one. Total mass divided by the mass of one. The total charge divided by the charge of one. The total energy divided by the energy for one. Okay, something total divided by something for one. Does that make sense? Remember that. Because you're going to see that again here in a, in a week or two. You're going to see that again in a couple of months. Okay, be prepared for that. 